Yeah, yes, I'm we do. Seeing, okay, yeah, good. Okay, then I'm starting my talk. Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, introducing me. Uh, as Rehano just said, uh, I'm Dilara. I think I'm, I'm going to do the introduction in the next slide, but this is going to be my talk. Thank you for inviting me. And this is going to be my talk about analyzing user behaviors and assisting users in ever advancing technology, which, uh, which combines my work with PhD and postdoc and also my future plans. And to give a brief introduction of my research, uh, I started my uh, academic career with my master's uh, at the Bozic University in 2015 in privacy negotiations in, in multi with multi-agent systems. Uh, this work included uh, fields, multi-agent uh, systems and agents, uh, and then privacy. And then I went to uh, University of Edinburgh in 2018 to do my PhD, and I did focus more on user behavior uh, in, this, in this part of my career with analyzing privacy in online social media, uh, which included the fields privacy, computational social science, and human computer interaction. Uh, and then uh, uh, between, sorry, between my uh, PhD and postdoc, I also did an internship with Max Planck Institute in Security and Privacy in Germany, in Bochum, uh, and then that was uh, focused on developer-centered security and privacy, which is something that I really like that combined privacy and human computer interaction. And in this study, we did um, uh, look at the Turkish startup developers' privacy and security perceptions, and this was a, a qualitative interview-based analysis and study. And then lastly, uh, in my postdoc, I worked on, I, I combined multi-agent systems, human computer interaction, and responsible AI uh, to uh, work as a postdoc at the University of Edinburgh. And then in this, in this project, we are trying to uh, help users that were harmed by automated systems decisions to get more answers and understand why these things happen and when they are harmed, to get answers from the companies uh, that harmed them. And then uh, lastly, in my uh, future work, I want to focus, bring all my expertise together, uh, and then focus on privacy, computational social science, human computer interaction, and responsible AI. And in the future future, I might uh, also include the multi-agent systems after getting the user behavior, and then I will model them and then do uh, multi-agent systems related studies. Um, this was a brief introduction on my career, and in this, in this talk, I'm only going to focus on my PhD and my postdoc and then my future plans. Uh, and then the first um, part of my talk was about my PhD that combined privacy, computational social science, and human computer interaction. Uh, you, you can say that I am mostly focusing on human factors and user-facing behaviors and then helping users uh, with, what, with their technological use. Uh, and then in my PhD, I had um, four studies uh, that was, uh, you can like divide them into two main paths. One path would be privacy leaks in online social networks, try to get, understand what kind of privacy leaks are happening on online social networks. And then second part would be uh, how users are coping with this, how can they, how are they using privacy settings to help regulate their boundaries. Uh, and then how do they understand the privacy settings that uh, the platforms are giving them? Um, you can say that I am mostly interested with interactions and information flows by the networks and interactions. Uh, even if you have the perfect privacy um, conscious behavior, your networks can leak information, and then it's actually a collective privacy behavior, so I am looking at this kind of situations where the collective privacy uh, leaks that's happened that unintended. And then to do this, I uh, focused on Twitter in my privacy, uh, in my PhD work, uh, which actually concluded in 2022, just before Elon Musk takeover. So uh, the, the things that I am talking uh, reflect that the functionality of that time between 2019, you could say, to 2022. And I did four studies uh, with combinations of different methods, so it's mixed method studies. I uh, usually had started with Twitter data collection, collect mass public data via Twitter API to detect and quantify a behavior. Well, the API is right now uh, basically unusable, uh, but it was usable when I was doing this. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then after the Twitter data collection and then having a quantitative analysis of that uh, data, I would go into user surveys to have targeted questions around the detected behavior uh, to get nu nuanced understanding. So this could be open-ended uh, questions with less people to do a qualitative analysis and thematic coding. 
Uh, and then secondly, we could do a close-ended uh, multiple choice questions to high with higher number of people to like do a quantitative analysis and get the prevalence of the behavior. So to give, uh, I'm going to give you a brief recap of what uh, privacy on Twitter and online social media, uh, to give actually maybe a historical knowledge of what Twitter was looking like, because it's really dynamic. Privacy changes, people's uses are changing. Uh, the privacy, like the functionality of the platforms are changing all the time. So I'm just going to give you, a, I'm, I'm sure everyone knows what social media is, and maybe you know some Twitter functionality, but just to give you a, a small recap, uh, where in social media we form connections and share information, observe others and interact with each other. And then one thing that like the researchers show that users underestimate the size that uh, their posts are reaching. Uh, so maybe some people think that they're only sharing with their friends or maybe their followers, but maybe if, if you are on Twitter, actually you are sharing with the, anyone who has access to internet and also uh, search engines indexing. Uh, and then this can uh, c cause a lot of uh, problems. For example, malicious people can do data inference. They can like, if you are using the same username with multiple social accounts, maybe you are sharing something on Twitter, you are sharing something on Instagram, you are sharing something on LinkedIn, and they can like um, combine this and uh, data chaining and do social engineering. Uh, and then to get maybe phishing and then like uh, do malicious activity. Uh, and then for example, this please drop me, uh, I'm not sure, uh, I don't think Foursquare is alive right now, but there was a, a website called Foursquare that where you could check in where you were in your location and this site was kind of like a raise awareness that you're right now telling that you're not at home. Uh, and then it's like, please drop me. Uh, so we can see that there, like, there can be a potential for unintended privacy leaks in this social media situations. And as I said, even if you have the perfect privacy understanding and settings set up, uh, your networks can uh, leak your information. So I, I did say settings before, but uh, every, every, def uh, every platform give you some private settings to uh, manage your flow of information and, and your boundaries. Uh, the research show that the default settings are preferred, and these defaults are usually less restrictive because companies doesn't, the, the social media companies doesn't want you to protect your information, basically. Uh, which we can see with the chat GPT now, they are taking everything and then they are doing lots of uh, data uh, processing and then using that data. So the, the platforms and organizations do not want you to like protect your information basically. So these default settings are really less restrictive and usually public. Uh, and then there are different types of settings. So there's no one standard way of like uh, giving private settings between the social media companies. Every social media company or platform decides, decides what they want to give to the users. So there are some highly granular settings like Facebook, where you can change the, the private settings of the post one by one. But there are also like um, simpler settings like Twitter, where there is like only one choice: you are either public or protected. And if you are public, everything is public. I'll go into that later. But I'm just going to talk about why did I choose Twitter in my studies because it's highly public. It's not like you can you have even you, you don't have to you don't even have to log in so anyone can see the tweets by default and as I said as a result maybe the good, like search engines can index them ChatGPT can use them uh, and then maybe they can create things like or oh, tweet like uh, use the ChatGPT to tweet like Obama or something uh, and then um, uh, interactions increase visibility so what happens is that someone likes your maybe someone famous likes your post and your post actually reaches to people that you didn't intend, intend and maybe you overnight go viral and this can cause really um, harmful to you, maybe like psychological damage and uh, it can have impacts onto your, onto your mental health. Uh, and then there are simpler uh, private settings in account-based settings, as I said, you are either public or protected. So one really, um, uh, I guess, really specific thing to Twitter is that once you're, if you, even if you are protected and then turn public, everything turns public. So even the things that you sent 10 years ago protected, they are now public, uh, up for grabs. Uh, and then uh, the platforms with the granular settings like Facebook are researched really widely. Uh, so I wanted to get into either, like to understand the actions and understandings of the, the users of these um, kind of simpler private settings. So to, I guess, to address the elephant in the room, 
so these literature studies are conducted between 2019 and 2022, uh, and then the presentation reflects the terminology and then the functionality of Twitter by that time, which I'll get to that right now. Uh, and then uh, for consistency, I'm going to use Twitter. I'm not going to uh, say Twitter X. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to say Twitter tweets, tweets, not posts. Um, so I, I've been talking about public accounts. I just wanted to give you some uh, understanding of what a public account, of what a protected account is. So public accounts, anyone can see them, uh, any user can follow, and then others can interact freely with these tweets. But, but with protected accounts, only followers can see it, and then uh, the protected accounts needs to approve followers, and then followers can like and reply, but cannot retweet or quote tweet these tweets. And then interactions, which is the, 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 I guess, the main part of my research in this PhD work, that uh, visibility of the tweets depends on the Twitter's account type. So what means is that even if you're a protected account saying something and your friend who has a public account replies to it, that reply is open. So anyone can see that reply and infer what you are saying in your protected account, like protected tweet. Uh, and then mentions of protected users can be seen publicly. Uh, anyone can mention you and there's no control on what the tweets can mention you. Uh, and then as I said, the tweet topics may be inferred by looking at the replies. Uh, deleting a tweet does not delete uh, the replies and then they stay in the platform and then searching at username will bring all public interactions, which I feel like I'm giving you a cheat sheet of how to stalk people, but yeah, I guess. So I guess after this uh, small introduction on Twitter, I'm going to go into what I did in my studies. The first uh, part of my studies, I did look uh, at, um, I looked at privacy leaks in online social networks, uh, which uh, were two studies, one first of them, uh, the first one is the life event detection. So I was looking at what kind of life events and personal information can be disclosed on Twitter by networks. And then I go into focusing on birthdays, which can cause date of birth leaks, which is a security problem. So yeah, what kind of personal information are disclosed online by networks on Twitter? So the, in the first, um, so these studies are usually Twitter data collection by the API. It's a, it's a high intensive data that we are getting uh, a lot of, um, I think, I'm not sure about the size of my data in my database, but I, I just want to say like millions and millions of tweets a day. And I've been, I, I did collect uh, tweets a lot of times. So in this one, I did collect uh, the tweets that have happy for you uh, for I think 40 days or maybe three months, I'm not sure. Uh, and then I did do some filtering. I did filter the things that doesn't have any mentions. So I wanted to look at only tweets that mention someone. Uh, and then to see, because the aim is to see, even if I don't look the, the first tweet, can I understand what the tweet was talking about? Uh, and then what I did was I did uh, collect six or 600K tweets. Uh, and then did a uh, text analysis, like NLP techniques, like um, latent reflect allocation, like LDA, use topic uh, modeling algorithms uh, to find that there were 12 life events in this uh, clusters, which I'll go into show which these life events are. But the, we can show with this, uh, basically in summary, with the study, we show that events can be inferred by the replies which is a privacy um, implication. And then even sensitive and private matters like mental health and surgery, illness recovery, and protected accounts are not protected enough uh, because when you can see, this is the graph that we have. Uh, you have different life events, for example, graduation, and then maybe uh, traveling, which might be neutral, uh, but you can also have things like familial matters and mental health and surgery recovery. Uh, and then you can see that the green ones is the, the ones that uh, tweets that replies to a public account, but the red ones, which was I think around 10%, 8%, uh, uh, that uh, mentions protected accounts. So do those accounts, we can see what they were talking about only looking at the replies, uh, which these accounts just say that explicitly change their settings to protect it, but their information is not protected. So potentially sensitive information is leaked. So in my second study, I wanted to focus more on one of the clusters that had birthdays because birthdays are um, like uh, special because it's like the celebrations are encouraged publicly. 
uh, with my with with our friends and family, it's normal that we um, um, I guess celebrate our birthdays. But with the introduction of technological advancement like social media, now we uh, carry that social norm to the social media. But it's not now. Now it's not only our friends and family that's seeing this. It's the whole internet, uh, which can cause really uh, problems in terms of, for example, with birthdays. Uh, this, this is amazing numbers, 0.85% of English tweets. I didn't do any filtering. I just like went into the 1% the sample, just collected everything, and then looked at the proportion of birthdays in them. And then 0.85% had birthday in them. Uh, and then I'm not even looking at happy birthday like HBD or whatever, but just only birthday. And then this is... Um, this is really a mind-blowing number for me. Uh, this shows that the celebrations on Twitter for tweet, like um, birthdays is really, really widespread. And then uh, if these birthday tweets have the age in them, so for example, happy 30th birthday, uh, that means that, that then you know that person's date of birth, uh, which is used in authentication. So in UK, for example, you, uh, you call NHS, uh, you tell them your surname and your date of birth, uh, and then it's just like they just give you your test results, basically. Uh, I, maybe that's not a problem in Turkey that much, uh, but in UK, date of birth is used a lot in authentication. Uh, and then for, and also you, people use passwords and pins. So pins are like conveniently four digits, so people use their birthdays or birth dates uh, on their uh, pins, ATM pins, and this is shown by the research. Uh, and then date of birth, in my research, I found that uh, date of birth was exposed for 1,000 accounts daily. And this is a lower threshold because I didn't do abbreviations, I didn't do misspellings. I only looked at happy birthday in that order. Uh, maybe not in that order, but if a tweet had happy and birthday in them, uh, and then uh, had seen that 1,000 accounts daily was exposed for date of birth, and then 10% were protected. And then what we did actually, which is uh, what I do in my studies is mixed methods. I go into uh, to the people and ask, what do they feel about this? Uh, so what I did was I did a small survey with 151 participants to ask them. We did ask a lot of things, but this is a summary uh, to like ask them like, are you comfortable with birthday sharing on Twitter or publicly uh, on on social media basically? And then 68% were comfortable with birthday sharing, but then surprisingly, nearly 50% was comfortable with the date of birth, potential date of birth week. Uh, and then we, what we say, and also uh, when we ask them what would you do if you want to, uh, if you, if a person um, celebrated your birthday, they were like, okay, I would like it, reply it, retweet, which is something we also found in the data and matched it. Uh, from my Twitter data collection, I also collected reactions and I matched it to the survey and they did uh, match. Uh, and then um, I guess in that one, um, there's like one really, uh, what we can say is that here that people are comfortable uh, and it's common to share birthday celebrations that might leak date of birth and then date of birth using authentication should cease and desist, I guess. Uh, and then uh, th with this survey actually really and also with the Twitter data collection, some really interesting behavior that we saw was that people were, uh, I, was, I was able to with the Twitter API, I was able to share, like, uh, reach some tweets sometime and I wasn't able to reach uh, maybe like two days later, I was like, what's happening? Did, did they delete the tweet? And then maybe two days later, I could reach it again. So I understood that they were changing their privacy settings to protect it in public again. So, well, the previous research shows that people do actually only either prefer the default settings or just set it at the first time and then leave it like that. So this behavior was really interesting that people were actively changing their privacy settings. Uh, and then in this survey, we asked people, uh, what is your account type? And we gave public protected and added sometimes protected to cache this behavior, like if some people would uh, define their account type as sometimes protected. And surprisingly, 10% said that they are sometimes protected. Um, so this brings me to the, the second part of my studies that I work at. Why are people are doing this? The privacy settings changing? Uh, are they trying to protect their privacy? Are they trying to... Um, basically, what are they, they, they trying to do? Uh, and then at the second part of my uh, research, I looked at, okay, these people are changing and utilizing the settings. Do they understand what's happening? So as I said, there were like a lot of people, 10%, uh, more than what we expect, sometimes protected. Uh, and then 
Settings apply to whole accounts, so why do, they, why do people do this? Uh, visibility of the TVs depend on the poster's account type. Even if you are protected five years, and then you turn public, every tweet that you had in the five years would be public now. Uh, and then uh, there are hidden interactions by protected accounts. So for example, if you're a protected account and reply to a famous person, they wouldn't be able to see your tweet. Or if you want to enter a giveaway, there are some giveaways on Twitter, you, you want to enter them and get some uh, maybe prize, you have to open your account to enter because they are counting, uh, because interactions increase visibility and the protected accounts uh, interactions doesn't increase the visibility that much, so they are like people usually say, okay, if you want to enter the giveaway, and also we have to see your answer, of course. Uh, so people do this, and uh, I guess one reason I would assume and envision that they are doing this because of this uh, kind of behavior to share, like uh, to show their interactions, and then we saw that switching phenomena occur really frequently, and then. Um, yeah, I guess this was my research question. Why do users change their privacy settings on Twitter? And now what I did uh, in this study was, again, uh, observe Twitter, do a large scale big data collection and analysis, uh, do statistical analysis on this data, and then go into the users and ask them, why, like, why are you doing this? And then try to match the, the data that I'm collecting from Twitter uh, to the user's behavior and to see if there's a difference between them. So what I did was a large scale people, 100, over 100K protected Twitter accounts. Uh, and then I did observe their changes for three months. For this one, I pinged their accounts uh, for every 30 minutes, basically for three months to see if their account was protected or public uh, automatically. And then uh, to see like how, how many times they change and to like see maybe a, a behavior that they are doing. Uh, maybe they are only like, for example, uh, protecting their account over the night or they opening up the, in the morning. Uh, and then we saw that nearly 40% uh, changed from these accounts. So this is a really high number. I know that we like, collected from protected Twitter accounts. Maybe if I collected only public accounts, they wouldn't change, but I wanted to go into the people that had protected accounts first, and then why are they opening their accounts? And then nearly 40% changed at least once in 19 days, and then uh, I think over 10% changed, 10% uh, changed over 10 times. Uh, person who changed 2000, uh, not, not 2000, sorry, that would be uh, amazing, uh, 287 times in 90 days, so that's like more than three or four times, kind of like three times uh, a day, I, I guess. They, they really like to uh, uh, play with their uh, privacy settings. And now what we found from the Twitter data, without going to the users, uh, doing a statistical analysis of people, uh, like we have 100K users, right? We have their uh, tweets when they were public and protected, we wanted to compare if there's any difference of uh, behavior. So we wanted to, and we saw that uh, people tweet and mention others uh, more when they're public. Uh, and then really interesting finding in this one, uh, people mention non-followers more in non-usual settings, which means is that when they are people when they're protected, they are mentioned non-followers when uh, they turn public to mention non-followers, which makes sense because they want to sh show their tweet. Uh, but really interesting is that people who are public turn protected to mention non-followers to maybe have some kind of like a back talking uh, in the and then before like uh, turning public may, maybe they are deleting those tweets. And really interesting behavior. Actually, someone asked uh, if this is a privacy behavior or an antisocial behavior, which is a really good question. I haven't got into that, but it can be both. It can be go both ways. A yeah, really interesting research question there. Uh, and then uh, I went to the users again to understand uh, why uh, these people are changing and utilizing in private settings. Uh, I did two surveys. One of them is open text with 100 people uh, to create common reasons. So we did qualitative analysis with thematic coding. We went to the answers and tried to like uh, class them uh, and to options. And then with these options, we did a multiple choice uh, a user survey to measure the prevalence. So how many people are thinking uh, and doing this because of uh, this, uh, this, for example, reason and that reason. And then divided people to according to uh, their audience type to see if there's a difference between people's uh, behavior, whether they are more protected or more balanced. Balanced means that nearly 50% of the time they are public, 50% of the time they are protected. And then really like uh, skimming over the results is that people turn public to interact with others in ways 
prevented by being protected, which makes sense. They are trying to do get the full functions of the Twitters or the platforms they are using, but they also want to um, protect their privacy in some way, but also want to get interactions. Uh, and then um, people turn protected to share their personal content and regulate boundaries. So what we saw actually from the Twitter data collection is that I actually I, I did all text analysis on the Twitter data to see if people were mentioning um, maybe sensitive content more when they're protected uh, instead of public. I did compare uh, the topics between these two groups and I didn't see any changes. That might be because they are not doing change, they are not changing any, they are saying the same things in both ways. Or maybe I think the one behavior that we caught is that people do delete things before turning back to the public. If people know what they are doing a bit like doing, know, know the, what the press settings is doing, they are saying things and protected, they delete them and go back to public, which I cannot catch in my Twitter data, which I actually caught in my user survey. Uh, and then, yeah, this is something, if you couldn't tell by now, this is like the, the thing that I'm most proud of. I really like this research. Uh, private switching is more common than expected. And then people do functionality, the trade-off between functionality and privacy. And they uh, use this private settings to regulate interactions rather than the content. And then last, my last PhD work is about how well users understand information visibility on Twitter. Uh, and then um, I focused, I, this is a purely survey a study. I didn't do any Twitter data collection in this one. Uh, 336 participants, I asked them different types of categories or questions uh, about Twitter uh, understanding. And then uh, you can see, I'm going to skim this because I don't have much time I'm seeing. Uh, so uh, what happened is that uh, people understand individual tweet visibility, which means that I am asking, if a person is protected, who can see it? And most of the survey takers understood what was happening, but the, the, per, like the part they were struggling the most was interaction, which is what I'm focusing on. So they didn't know if a protected account got a reply from a public one it would be public for all of people. Uh, it wouldn't be, for example, in this one, uh, if you could look at the top left one, so that one is the one that I'm talking about. So if a protected account gets a public reply, uh, reply from a public account, what would happen? And uh, people were conf mostly confused about these uh, uh, situations. And if you like, look at the last row, that's the uh, interactions with the public account, which people knew what was happening basically. And then lastly, yeah, this is uh, tweet visibility understanding. We got into this study assuming that switching people would know better, actually. Uh, and then doing a statistical analysis on our surveys, we found that actually having a switching account type did not necessarily translate into better understanding than the public accounts, for example, um, uh, in this one. Uh, we saw that in individual information is understood, but interaction visibility are unclear. Uh, and then there is... Um, I think the, the one thing that people uh, in showed indication of better understanding was Twitter usage frequency and then interacting with protected accounts. So if someone protect, they interacted a lot with a protected account, they knew what was happening. And then, this, uh, and then afterwards, I went into my postdoc, which I wanted to combine my multi-agent systems, human computer interaction and responsible AI uh, fields. Uh, because in my PhD work, I did mostly do analyzing user behavior. And then I wanted to have something, okay, how can we help users now? I want to do more uh, kind of research that will have, for example, an outcome or output of a for prototype that, will, that we would be evaluating uh, with also users because I am uh, from the human computer interaction uh, field. So in this one, uh, we looked at um, our, our project name is, is much longer, but I want to just say Answerable Social Technical Systems. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, so social technical systems combine social and technological factors. There are many humans and machine components working together, and their internal workings may not be clear. Uh, even without the AI involving, uh, if you go into a big company, it's not really easy when something goes wrong, who is responsible to like allocate who is responsible. This, this is called responsibility gap in philosophy. Uh, and then it's uh, for taking actions. There are like many hands in one decision. Uh, if that decision is wrong, who is going to be responsible? Uh, and then um, it's more complicated when artificial intelligence systems are involved because usually with the black 
black box systems, usually even the de developers or the people who are working with machine learning does, don't know what's happening in the, in behind in the, in the machine learning systems. Uh, so we, we argue that answerable systems are needed uh, to support the users and also increase the fairness and transparency of these uh, systems and also, I guess, um, increase their adaptability going forward in the, in the world. So what do we mean by answerability is, is, a, is a way to build trust with the machines and, the, and then AI systems uh, by not only like giving explanations, so it's not only explainable AI, but also giving justifications, ex excuses for the actions, and also maybe uh, reforms and apologies and saying, okay, you were harmed by this, but, and we see that there's a problem and we are going to fix this. It's not possible right now, but we are working on to fix this. Uh, to maybe get commitments from, uh, from the organizations that use these AI systems. So one thing I have is that there's like an example scenario we always use is a real case, uh, the opioid treatment uh, in US is an epidemic, uh, people has addiction problems, uh, and then uh, there was like a, a hospital using a third party, uh, using um, um, third party algorithm to calculate scores, and then this person's uh, treatment was stopped midway because they had a like a really high risk score. And then this is really black box system, company doesn't give what they are used, like they, they do give the features, but uh, for example, uh, number of prescriptions, number of doctors visited, but they do not give how these uh, variables interact and how do they calculate the score. Uh, but in the end, this Catherine person, uh, after like cumbersome investigation uh, by herself, found that their, her sick dog's prescription hiked um, the score incorrectly because dogs also need really higher dose of opioids. Uh, and then, we actually, in, in our system, we want to help Catherine. So how can we help Catherine to get the answers really quickly and, and expedite the process, the streamline, uh, to ask answers from these companies or hospitals or responsible uh, uh, organizations? So this is actually, I really, I know that this is like really big questions and uh, it's not, there's not going to be one answers and also like the, the answers are not going to be really quickly found or implemented. But this is an exploratory, I guess, uh, work that um, is conducted interdisciplinary between the School of Philosophy, which uh, our colleagues are doing things like uh, to think about what does it mean to be an, uh, like what does it mean for an autonomous system to be responsible? Can an AI system be even responsible? And then uh, our colleagues from Usher Institute from Sociology and Law are doing things with the users, what does it mean? Uh, uh, anticipate what types of answers these users are needing. Uh, they are doing workshops, study focus groups uh, to understand what type of answers the people need and also with our partners here with NHS, Scottish Government and SAS uh, to go with them, do interviews and if there was a tool, uh, would you use this kind of a tool or what would you want in this kind of a tool? And we as informatics team are actually creating and designing this tool based on the feedback so we are doing, uh, can we design a dialogue agent uh, that will expedite the process of seeking answers? Uh, just, a, just a quick note that this was, uh, this proposal was written just before the chatbot boom. So, and then when we said dialogue agent, we were thinking about really formal argumentation, dialogue, representation, and, and then chatbots came, which can be a blessing or a curse in disguise because one thing is that now everyone, oh, you're working on chatbots, but also in the second one, oh, you're like, Oh, chapels, of course, I know what they are. So I guess there's some kind of uh, pros and cons there. But we have uh, three uh, industry partners and government partners. And then to give you a really, uh, ha like a s really quick, um, I guess, uh, overview, what I do is I do, a, a, we are creating a mediator agent framework. We are doing a, like a state machine. Uh, we are uh, creating the dialogue steps, dialogue states and what kind of, uh, like, incre to increase the user understanding and enable harmful, a harmful actions to be examined and addressed by companies, uh, and then uh, identify and connect users with companies that seek, like, users seeking restitution. So we created a dialogue with three stages, explanation, uh, action update, and remedy, and we have, like, uh, we created, designed the system uh, with the, the formal uh, steps and language. Uh, for example, we are using dialogue game description language uh, to do a formal representation of the dialogues. Uh, we are defining locutions and control the dialogue with this uh, framework. And then we are also creating no ontologies to have knowledge representation 
uh, to like um, connect actions and reasons be t together and then harms and remedies. For example, what kind of harm, what kind of remedy would suit a, a harm? For example, if the harm is too big, uh, maybe in any kind of remedy would not match it. But if it's maybe something, a small mistake, maybe five pound watcher could be, um, could be enough. Uh, and then we do a really small uh, chatbot interface. Uh, we have a proof of concept early version. We have a better version now, actually. Uh, this was uh, published, like maybe open to public for like a year ago. We have now uh, progressed in this, but it's still work in progress, so we did not open it yet. And then lastly, I want to go into my, really quickly go into uh, what I am planning to do in my future to bring all these fields together. I have three main, um, two main uh, tracks I have in mind. For example, for the first one is uh, online social norms on privacy behaviors, on platform specific behaviors. So I only focused on Twitter. I only focused on UK population. I only focused on English speaking people. So I want to go into uh, what these social norms and privacy behaviors mean for other people, maybe in Turkey, maybe in US, maybe in another country uh, to have, uh, or maybe something on Twitter and then something on, I'll go into that later, uh, but to like, get some platform specific behaviors, understand them, and then culture, how to increase privacy awareness. So we analyze this, but as computer engineers, how can we help these people to increase their awareness so they can have more informed uh, choices? And then second path would be generative AI tools and user perceptions. So we have lots of generative AI tools with ChatGPT and MidJourney, and then these tools are given to public really quickly, and then people are using it, but uh, do they have any privacy protection strategies in their minds or are they even informed about the privacy complications of the systems? And maybe the cultural differences used, like what people are using a chat GPT for, is it different between UK and US and Turkey? So yeah, I, I did uh, give a really sm summary in there, but yeah, I want to focus more on platform specific and cross-platform social norms. Uh, Twitter users actually migrated to different platforms uh, such as Blue Sky, Mastodon, and Threads. There were like a migration. Why do people, why some people migrate and why some people stay is something that I'm really interested in. And a comparison of the privacy settings they have on these platforms or whether that the people carry their privacy setting understandings from one platform to another is something that I'm really interested in. Uh, and then, um, of course, the cultural differences and online social norms. Privacy is a really dynamic concept. It's really culture specific. Is there any difference? between Turkey and UK and US and maybe Saudi Arabia, for example. Uh, and then how to increase privacy awareness and understandings of for online social platforms is one path. And then in the second path, I have the generative AI tools and user perceptions. How do people use them? Uh, what are the pri privacy protection strategies while they're using them or even they know? So this one I have uh, user survey and semi-structured interviews uh, in mind, but also maybe a data collection from Twitter. People share things, they, they, they say, I what was given, so this can be also do a Twitter or maybe social media data collection. And then again, again, uh, how does the cultural differences impact the privacy behaviors and social norms? And I am coming up, it's going, it's finishing, it's the last slide. And uh, like the last uh, part of my maybe future, future direction uh, I have is that generative AI tools and developer perceptions. I want to look at how do developers, because there are lots of AI boom right now, AI startups using ChatGPT, a lot of like LLMs, there are lots of startups coming up, and then those people, how do the developers who create these generative AI uh, apps uh, deal with security and privacy risks? Uh, what are their considerations? Uh, and then how can we enable, like the, protecting the privacy or the, or the security of the people has multiple factors. One of them is, of course, the increase in the user awareness, but if we do you, like increase the developer and company awareness, there is no, maybe there's less ways for users to go wrong. Uh, so I want to focus more on to the developer side too, which is really similar to what I did in my PhD internship. I went to Turkish startup developers, did interviews with them to get their privacy and security understandings, uh, and then maybe develop a guidelines for them to use in the future. Uh, and then, yeah, and then thank you so much for listening. I know I went a bit over of time, but thank you. <laughs> Yeah, is there any questions from the audience first?